This episode mentions suicide and may be triggering for some listeners. Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Oh, welcome to the show, you lucky listeners. Today, you're so lucky. I am. We're in a series called For the Love of Therapy, and it has been really wonderful, really wonderful. If you've list, if first of all, if you've missed one, go back and catch them. Um, addendum to that, just if you haven't already subscribed to this show, just do it. It'll take you about six seconds, wherever you listen to a podcast and you'll just never miss an episode. They'll just stay nice and saved for you. Um, cause I would definitely want you to go back and listen to any episodes you've missed in this particular series. We've had incredible conversations with therapists. Um, we've given ourselves a chance to have virtual visits with some of the top leaders in this area. And, you know, we've also had folks who have experienced the transformation that happens through just the healing journey of therapy and all very, very honest, all very, very true. I have found it personally rewarding and instructive and connective. And I've learned so much um, personally, just from this, from this particular series. And our last guest is the perfect person to wrap this up really because she is so wise one of my most my friends with the most amount of wisdom and thoughtful and she's so curious and she cares about and is a student of people she's not a therapist but she acts like one and tons of us count me in, find conversation with her to be therapeutic because she is such a profound listener and she has a real skill for getting to the heart of, of not just an issue, but who we are, which she and I are going to talk about here in a minute. It's a, it's a, it's a rare quality. I've learned so much from her about this and about what it means to really burrow deep, what it really means to get at it with each other and with our own selves and our own stories. And she is certainly no stranger to this show. She's been on a number of times, which I'm going to tell her right at the beginning, right at the top of the show. Um, and I've been on hers several times and we are, we are true friends. And I've never walked away from any conversation with her, be it sort of like this in a, I guess a formal setting or like a career setting or just across the dinner table that I haven't left feeling so interested and I've been provoked to thought and she piques my curiosity and, um, because she's like that. Of course, I'm talking about Kelly Corrigan best Kelly. Um, and she's got so much insight right now into this conversation, into culture, into change makers, into what it means to move past the small talk and get to the connection. She's so good at this. It's she's the host of a PBS show called tell me more literally where she sits across from some of the most interesting and well-known people but she comes away with insight that no other interviews even get close to. This is the gift of her. Um, she also hosts her own po podcast, Kelly Corgan Wonders. She and I actually did a podcast episode swap not too long ago where we recorded four episodes and we put them on her show and we put them on my show and we had really deep conversations around men. The men we love is actually what we called it change, adult friendship, and hard stuff, suffering and recovery, essentially. Um, and I'm just telling you, it was every bit as therapeutic as sitting in the counselor's chair. So uh, if you don't know Kelly, she's written a lot of great books. Tell me more, Glitter and Glue, my personal favorite of all time, The Middle Place. She's beloved for a reason. She's bitingly funny and witty. 
She, she's her own person and she is just unique in the world. And there is a million reasons why I love her. And I am so grateful. She's in my life. I treasure her. Uh, you certainly will too, after this conversation, if you're new to her. So I'm just delighted again to bring to the show, the irreplaceable Kelly Corrigan. I am just delighted to see you as always. I like any reason to talk to you ever in any format for any or purpose. Not. We don't care. I I don't care where we are. Um, also, this is really exciting and get excited about this. Um, I don't know if you know how Saturday Night Live has like the five timers club. They have like a jacket and they have a deal. Yes, yes, well, yes. As of right this second for the love podcast does too. And you're its first member. Congratulations. I know this Thank is a you. big deal for Thank you. Thank you. It's a big deal for you. So like, it's like me and Steve Martin mm-hmm. and I think Martin Short's a five timer. Yeah. You have to be kind of yeah. old to be a five timer, but I'm not going to factor that into my thinking. I'm just going to take the compliment. That's right. No, just take it as you're a fan favorite. That's why you're a five timer. Have you ever seen Martin Short in um, New York? I have not. That's not someone I've seen. I've seen Steve Martin. Oh yeah. yeah. I saw Martin short the last time I was there, we were in some, you know how New York is just so New York just loves itself. There's like this little restaurant right over by Broadway and you have to know where you're going. You'd never see it. There's not like a sign. There's not some door that looks like a restaurant. You kind of go up some brownstone steps and then it's behind a curtain for God's sake. Like I can't remember what it's called. Um, we were there with people who know things like this. Anyway, it's teeny inside, very boutique, very, you know, very Broadway fancy. Maybe it maybe seats 20 people. And of course, in comes Martin Short and all his favorite friends. We're all fresh off of a show. Perfect. And I didn't do great. I I was with Tyler. <laughs> I get nervous when I meet famous people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get starstruck is what I get. Let me be fair. I, I get like, I love Martin Short. He's a comedy hero. Yeah. I, and you're an I, enthusiast. You're like a life, I'm an enthusiast. Like yeah. Thank you for understanding that about me. I'm just mm-hmm. an enthusiast. And so I was like, Tyler's like, let's say hi when he comes back out of the bathroom. I'm like, we will not. We will not. I would I I don't allow it. But we Tyler can't. has to too, because he's like a total theater guy. Total theater guy. And if I'm an enthusiast, he's the president right. of the enthusiasm club. And so yeah, he's a 10 Xer. He's a 10 Xer. Yeah. So of course he stops him coming back from the bathroom. And I was just frozen like a statue. I didn't say one word. I was like this, not is one t- word. Is Tyler literally twice the size as Martin Short? Like is Martin Short yeah. like five feet tall or and hundred pounds? He's twice the size of Martin Short. He could have like <laughs> hoisted Martin on his hip and carried him like a baby. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine that. I can picture it. Um, I, I am so thankful that you're here today. I've just got so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, anytime, anywhere, you know that I do. Thank you. It's ditto. I we're in a series right now on therapy, which I've been loving. Um, and therapy just has a whole new and different iteration right now in our adult lives than it ever did. Well, I, it had no iteration for me growing up. I, I remember one time in 1992, I came home from my first year of college and I was taking a walk with one of my best friends from high school. And she was like telling me some really hard things that had happened. And she was like, I'm in counseling. I'm like, counseling. Like right. that was only, that was for the worst problems that earth could imagine. To like, me, it was like for soldiers. It was like something that people yes. from MASH would do. Like you would crack up on the yes. battlefield and they would send you to this kind of person or Woody Allen. Like either <laughs> you were just like loved your neuroses exactly. and never wanted it to end and wanted to share right. it. Or you were, you know, deeply disturbed for very good reasons and needed constant guidance. That was exactly my perception of it. I don't know if this was regional or not. You know, you grew up sort of East Coast and I grew up... Midwest and South, but I'm pretty sure that the taboo around the subject was about the same um, as we came up. I'm curious about what was your, um, 
what was your front door into therapy? Like, how old were you? Where were you that you started to wonder about it? Or did somebody in your life begin to normalize it for you? Um, did you have any negative stuff that you had to leap over to get to it? Uh, I'm just, I'm trying to think about my first sort of foray into it as well. Yeah. So, you know, I was raised by this woman who, um, would think, thinks 90% of everything that happens on planet earth is totally indulgent. And she, she's a person who wants to go to church every day and work it out quietly in the privacy of your own mind. And, and she's, you know, that kind of works for her. Like, I don't, I don't judge her. Ultimately, I don't look at her and think, man, you could have really used some therapy. I think the way you did it was maybe right for you. And, you know, she's had a fairly nice life. I mean, there haven't been any terrible tragedies or surprises, except she lost her brother at 46 to a brain tumor. But in her family, that would be just the kind of thing you would take with you to church every day. It would be just the kind of thing that, that God would explain for you in a way that could help you settle it into a position in your mind and your heart that didn't need constant reevaluation. When I went to college, I felt like we were all deeply curious about one another in a way that high school didn't permit. Like this, there was just so much time to talk and there was so much alcohol, which totally lowered everybody's inhibitions and maybe other things that would lower people's inhibitions. And so we, we, we were into like deep conversation, my little crew of people. And then one of those friends got married the summer after we graduated from high school. I mean, sorry, the summer after we graduated from college, which was most unusual. I mean, I got married a full 10 years later and it was not working. Like from the jump, it was a brutal marriage. And so they entered counseling and then she also got her own therapist and she became this person who was telling us everything she was learning in therapy for our own good. And so the ideas that she was sharing, we were all like starving for, and she was giving us so much to hang things on in our own lives. And so many, like, like she taught me, don't complain, don't explain, which is like a miraculous thing to learn at that age. Like you're allowed to have wants and needs and you're allowed to pursue them and you do not have to justify them and you do not have to apologize for them. You can just say, I don't think that's a job for me, or I don't think this is a relationship for me, or I think I'm going to move. Um, and so we started like glomming on to everything that this buddy was telling us. And I think it was incredibly therapeutic for her to flip from the student to the teacher, like in that way that, you know, they always talk about teens and how much they learn when they tutor, like peer counseling type stuff, because they're able to be in the more esteemed position of sharing the information rather than catching the information. And I think for this buddy of mine, you know, therapy and the whole process of like having a failed marriage and having to wiggle out of it and being so young and having people staring at you, you know, has its has certain humiliations attached to it. And then for her to be able to share it with us was just a very enlarging thing for her. Like it was the, it was the most solid that she sounded in those seven years. She would go from like weeping to like, kind of like a great teacher. Yeah. And so it felt good all the way around. It felt like it was a good thing for her. And, mm. and we were, you know, taking notes. That's so interesting that, um, it has me thinking even about my own work. I'm like, there is something therapeutic about taking the garbage that we experience and turning it into usefulness for other people. It's very similar. Anyway, that I'm, um, that's a side it's note. Almost but that just, the whole silver lining of all yeah. hardship is yeah, that you become more useful. Like, I feel like that about cancer stuff all the time. I had cancer when I was 36 and it just made me an enormously um, useful person. And it, and it's things like that, a divorce, financial ruin, cancer, uh, early loss are super transferable. Like there's only, there's only so many things happening in the world on any given day. And there it's just a giant archetypal themes that a lot of things actually end up fitting into. And so if you 
learned your lesson in one silo, you, you, it's probably why we can be friends, you and me. Like, it's probably where we're meeting. And I don't know if, I don't know if before that moment, I had as much to offer. I mean, I just didn't have reference points Same. that I have now. Yeah. Same. It's a very strange alchemy to get on the other side of loss or a, a period of suffering and realize that like, well, I've thought before I'm writing right now. I'm in a, I'm in the middle of a writing project and s- several times I'm like, what was I even saying before? Like, what was I even saying? What did I even know? Like, what? And I know that's, uh, that's absurd and it's extreme, but like the, the depth that suffering brings us to, I just, I hate that system. I frankly, I hate that. It's just simply true. Um, the other piece you, is that it creates so much trust. So if I know amongst people, yeah. yeah. So like we're both, you know, so out there publicly with books and podcasts and everything else that people know that, that we know like game knows game. And I know because I've been on tour with you before, like that when we do those VIP photos and stuff, like people are approaching us specifically for the things we learned the hard way. Yeah, that's right. Um, I was just in Kansas city last weekend with Tyler and we were doing an event together and, and it was that moment um, that you just described. So it's after, and the people are, you know, hundred people or whatever are going to come and have a minute. And we don't have time to get into anything cute or funny or it's people will stand there and just say like, I need, this is where we connected and it's over the hardest, saddest thing. And one of my um, colleagues was asking me like how that felt to me to kind of be a receiver of just 60 second traumas one after another for that long, for an hour and a half. And I just said, it it is become like the most beautiful connective tissue in the community. It's the realest thing we can say to each other. It's just the realest, truest thing that we can invite each other into. And there's something kind of sacred there and precious. Um, It also takes away the potential that you are uniquely afflicted. Which oh is God, like that's so true. Problem to suffering. There's like suffering and then there's this mistaken idea that you are lonely in your suffering, that you're alone in it, that, you, that people don't know. And so all that reassurance that like, got that, yep, I have somebody, I had a thing. It is like this, it makes it undeniable that no one is uniquely afflicted. And to remove that from suffering is to lighten it. You're right, it is. It is um, a ticket out of loneliness. Um, suffering only feels lonely, but it's no one is alone in it ever. Like you're right. There's only so many ways to have pain and everybody who has escapes? it. Who escapes? Yeah, nobody. Well, I thought for when I was younger that if I did the formulas right, you know, if I put the right ingredients in the soup pot as instructed, um, I could control outcomes. I believed that for a while. Of course. Yeah, I believe that. I mean, for a I while. know people, I know that, and I think it's a belief that you're always in danger of readopting, like as things get further and further away from you, which is probably um, a, a genetically defined benefit to us because to, to feel in threat at all times would be intolerable. But I remember when I was early diagnosed, I was 36, a huge seven centimeter tumor. And everyone said, was it in your family? And it was like, oh, I just know how badly you want me to say yes. Because then it's like, if it's not in yours, you're fine. You're safe. And I knew that like 70% of breast cancers are not genetically, we're not, there's not a genetic predisposition or there's not like a known gene yet. Like 10 years from now, there might be another gene. But man, that's a real grown up thing to tell people is like, yeah, sorry to say, like, 
doesn't matter what side of the street you walk on, you still might get it. That's right. If you're anything like me, your size may go up or down a little. Like our bodies just fluctuate like bodies do from week to week, month to month, sometimes year to year. That's normal. It's okay. It's even good sometimes. It's just we're human people with human bodies. But sometimes it can make clothes kind of annoying and dumb. Like even small shifts are enough to make a size change, which can be a problem because we can't just buy clothes forever, right? So I see you raising your hand out there. You're with me on this. I, I get fights into zippers just like the rest of us. So here's what I want you to know and a hack that I have discovered for myself. My friends over at Able Clothing have solved this problem with something new, and they're calling it the Size Swap Program for, I'm not kidding, forever amount of time. When you shop their size swap collection, you can exchange these items for a new size that fits you best for free and for always. It's the easy button for clothes. And some of our favorite looks are in the size swap collection, including the best denim jacket in the world that I obsess over. Tons of amazing like layering shirts and graphic tees, the most delicious leather jacket you've ever seen. Dresses, cardigans, you guys even choose. This is just one more way. Abel is out here doing the absolute most with their amazing style for everyone and their ethical practices. So head over to ableclothing.com and use my code JEN to save a little something extra. So that's ableclothing.com, code JEN. We've been having some conversations over on the socials about the P word. You know the one, perimenopause. I guess this is a thing now for me, and maybe you're there too. But anyway, a lot of weird things are going on in my body right now. And one common issue that every one of us in this season of life seems to have trouble with is sleep. It's like that elusive thing we're chasing and we can't seem to catch. But here's the thing. I've hacked it. Thanks to Focal. I really have. I'm shook by how much this has helped my sleep situation. They've, it's literally changed my sleep game. I started with their drops, and right now I've been loving their full-spectrum sleep gummies. I take them every night. They help me fall asleep, and more importantly for me, they help me stay asleep. Because in the before times, I'd catch a thought at 3 a.m., and then that was it. My brain was like, let's go. So even if you're not in perimenopause, but your sleep is just off, for a million other reasons, give them a go. I've got a code for you if you want to try them out. Use code for the love to get 20% off at focal.com. So let me spell that for you. It's F O C L dot com. Okay. And your code is for the love for 20% off because sleep is priceless. Y'all thank me later. All these ideas like this vulnerability that we're talking about, um, uh, being a truth teller, um, having a, a sense of transparency between people, um, ideas like boundaries and trauma. These were just literally not words that I grew up with. I, well, really, exactly nobody was talking about this stuff when I was coming of age. And I didn't see it modeled in my parents. Um, I That is it's just... For me, it's not that it has grown and evolved. It's that it materialized out of thin air, like this sort of therapeutic zeitgeist, which now, I mean, our kids, our girls and my sons are absolutely growing up in it. I mean, they don't know another way. And so nobody, when we were growing up, uh, do you ever look backward? I look backward sometimes with I with these eyes and spot people in my life that were precious to me going through panic attacks, depression, anxiety, um, all sorts of like mental health suffering. And we called it moodiness or uh, did you, can you kind of, do you, do, can you see that? Like looking back on, our peers and friends and even family members who were just unserved. Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. listen, we had a guy in my older brother's class who committed suicide. And then my parents had a friend who committed suicide yeah. and boy, there just wasn't a lot of discussion about it. Now I, I do think that there will be this interesting 
and maybe necessary slight correction to where we are. Because I think that there is some concern that the language of therapy is being misused and we're labeling each other and ourselves inaccurately or sort of there's a diagnosis inflation where it's like, I definitely have ADD or like, he's totally bipolar or like, he's a narcissist. Like we're, we're using official terms in colloquial ways and probably not to our benefit. And so I think it's, I think it's, there will be this need to be more careful about how we talk about each other and ourselves such that we just get the right treatment. You know, the two, the two people that I referred to committed suicide, like needed a completely different kind of treatment than the, the moody kid who turns out was just like an honest to God introvert who found being on the bus kind of torturous. Fortunately, life does not require that you be on a bus. So as soon as he got out of school, he was fine. So I think, I think, um, I think it's so sad to think about those two cases and, and so many others. It's, it, here's an interesting story. A friend of mine had a father who recently died and he went undiagnosed bipolar for a million years, 50, 55 years or something. And then he was finally diagnosed and he was medicated and treated. And she was working on his eulogy and she put in the eulogy I mean, she talked to her siblings and made sure it was okay, but she put in her eulogy. At some point she said, he did this, did this, and he did this. And every day of his life, he fought with anxiety and depression and mental illness. And when she finished, I gave her a hug and said, I think it's so wonderful that you included that because it's this huge step. Like, I mean, there, there, I'm sure that there are decades of funerals where somebody took their own life and it is not acknowledged at the funeral. And I totally understand that. I mean, I wouldn't want somebody to tell me what to acknowledge or or not, but I, I think it's, I think it suggests that this is something that should be kept very, very secret. And that's probably to no one's benefit. But anyway, she said, well, the reason I shared it is because my gut was there's gotta be somebody in this room who needs to hear it. Two older men, two men in their eighties, came up to her and said, kind of grabbed her by the arm and got in her ear and said, I have that problem too. That's a, that we, I'm living with that too. And it was like for her, and then for her to just be able to hug him or that, for that to be the reaction to that instead of like pulling back, but to like come all the way in and just hug them and let them hug her. Like that's a, that's a great change in our sort of cultural attitudes around wellness and unwellness. Mm. Wow. That gave me goosebumps. I know it, it was such a, it's generous. I mean, in that, mm. in that way that it can be generative. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It is generous. It is. Um, there is something kind about honesty and saying these things out loud because they're, they're very ubiquitous. I mean, these are not, these are not isolated outlier experiences in the the human condition at all. Now to your earlier point, I, I completely agree on the need for a a slight bit of course correction on some, I see this in my kids who are all in their early twenties and they ha- they essentially pathologize everything. Um, a bad mood is pe- they, they have they have they 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 have a diagnosis. Um, and sometimes I'm like, she has ADD. She goes, I think I have yeah. ADD. And this oh yes, yeah. three of my biology. kids are telling me that. Yeah, and I said, um, tell me why. And she said, well, I mean, like, there's this class that like I don't care at all about. I'm not interested in the subject at all. I have to take it. And uh, I just cannot make myself do the work. And I was just kind of smiling at her like, wow, where did the expectation come? Because I don't think I would, I don't think I would set that expectation up. That you would be 
able to be equally productive across all fronts, regardless of your natural interest. Did you ask her that? It's insane to me. Like, why, why did you think that was going to be the case? Yeah. Yeah, I, th- you're right. There is the possibility um, for these terms and answers or diagnoses to provide an escape hatch out of well, personal responsibility or even just, or just boredom. To be a bridge from uncertainty to certainty like that. We're always like seeking that bridge. We're always seeking to get out of the mud and into something dry, onto dry land. And so it's just right there for you all the time. You can leave like this jumble of sensory data of like my stomach kind of hurts and I'm kind of nervous about going to that party. And I didn't like the way that guy just looked at me. And instead of having to process like that variety of senses, you can just say, I have social anxiety. And it's like, I don't think so. I think there, I think people with social anxiety don't go to the party. I think people with social anxiety might not go to college. I don't think people with social anxiety, like join the sorority. Like, I think it's a more severe thing. And I think if you're standing next to someone who actually has social anxiety and you're kind of like flippantly claiming that you might be really bumming them out. Like they might be like, Oh my God, now it's like the it thing, but I'm over here like dying. Like I can't eat all day when I have a social requirement. I don't sleep that night. Like there it's, but the claim said this thing to me that, I think it's really interesting. I I don't know if she minds me sharing it, but she had this question that maybe it is so, you know, the term basic, it's it's this huge insult that, that people in our kids generation say she's so basic. To be basic is to be like cisgender and straight and not really have any problems. And because it's such an insult, it might be pushing people to identify with groups that are more troubled mm. so that they're not in that terrible category. Basic. Mm. I mean, who knows if she's right, but it, it, I did think it was an interesting observation. Yeah, I remembered you're right. it from, um, I went to this amazing mother's group in Berkeley after I, Georgia was born 22 years ago. And everything was going okay for us. Like my boobs worked, the breastfeeding was fine. I didn't have thrush. She slept decently. The poop was coming. Like all the early signs seemed to be like, this is going to be a decent experience. And Edward was pretty decent. And so there were 10 of us and people were having terrible problems. Like their boobs were like bleeding practically. And their baby was constipated. There was somebody who had colic. Somebody's husband didn't do anything. And I remember when everyone was sharing that I almost felt like I should make something up so that I wasn't too basic, that I wasn't like, mm. I, cause I wanted them. I didn't yeah. want them to hate me mm. because it was kind of going. Okay. Mm. There's something to that. Right. Yeah. I want to fit um, in and, because belonging and being, is like, talk about the ultimate drive. Belonging. Yeah. There's something about being exceptional for better or for worse that is um, appealing You know, I, whether I'm exceptional because it's, I'm, I'm just that weird or my, my thing is just that hard. Um, it's yeah, I could see the appeal for that. I see that in a couple of my kids too. I I think it's interesting thinking about the desire to add a, a label sometimes onto something. But for me, like what therapy has really helped me do, because I get the compulsion. Um, Frankly, we just are, we don't care for discomfort. Like we just, we don't care for uncomfortable feelings or we don't care for boredom. For example, I'm not interested in the subject matter. So I must have ADD. We don't care for um, monotony. We don't care for conflict or struggle, or um, we certainly don't care for our own failures. And so it is more convenient, certainly, to be able to helicopter it onto a a label and say, well, it's not my fault. Um, But therapy for me has forced me to confront and deal with or learn how to deal with, really, for the first time in my adult life, all those bad feelings. What does it mean when you feel mad? My, I cannot, my therapist, Carissa, I wish I had one nickel 
for every time we sat in therapy and she would tell me, Jen, again, sad is not bad. Mad is not bad. And hard is not bad. And I'm like, they feel bad. <laughs> they so wait, feel let me bad. just double check what you're saying here. <laughs> yeah. I'm just supposed to live with these emotions? That's like, right. Is that what I'm paying for? Exactly. And like, yeah. I'm paying you to tell me how to not feel like that anymore. Yeah. And so learning how to sit in a, something uncomfortable or even painful. Yes. It's a skill set. It's, it's new skills for me. Um, yeah, that is embodied. There's, are you, I feel like you would be, I feel oh, like you're good at this. I'm really not. I'm, I'm mm. really, I'm really good at sitting with other people's stuff. So if you tell me your stuff, like I'm not going to interrupt you, I'm going to ask for more. I'm not going to try to clean it up. I'm not going to try to say, well, at least such and such like uh, that I can, I can do. And, and I, I'm not afraid and I, and I think I'm communicating like a general confidence that comes with saying like, you can tell me everything. Like, I'm still not going to be afraid for you, which is, you know, an interesting message to give back to somebody is like, yes, this is totally awful. And yes, I believe there's a day, another day for you coming. But like when I'm really worried about something and it's only, it's only my kids. This is the only thing that could really do it to me in the night so far right now. Um, I'm not that good at, at processing that. I'm not that good at, um, like the only technique that I've sort of working on a little bit that I'm finding helpful is to, um, the, the words I say are like less self, like stop being you. So then I go like, I'm Kelly Corrigan. I'm in bed. I'm worrying about this kid or this kid and this specific thing. And then I go, I'm a mom worried about her kid. And now I'm like one of 25 million at that instant. And then I say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a parent thinking about my family. So I keep abstracting out. And then I say, I'm, I'm a person on the planet who is like a little stirred up right now. And the, and if I can become, if I can melt into some larger number and really I'm, I'm completely convinced that the simultaneity of it is true. That I know that right that instant in beds all over the world, there are people doing exactly what I'm doing. Then it starts to feel like I, I'm not uniquely afflicted. This isn't like a, I, I haven't been visited by, you know, I'm not cursed. And this is part of the human experience and it's okay. And then I can just kind of float away from it. That's the only thing that's sometimes works. Sometimes I put my hand on my belly and a hand on my heart and I try to breathe more slowly. Not that I'm aware that I'm breathing fast because I'm, you know, I'm just have woken up in the middle of the night, but I just like give myself a little love. Like sometimes that helps. Like I, I do, th I do think that there are, I think sometimes you can um, do your way out of a thought. Like you can, there are, we're physical beings and we're in this physical body and which is our ultimate context. And so you could have a drink of water. Like sometimes I stand up and I do like a downward dog and I'm like, just let the molecules move. And then I like start over. Like I get back in bed as if it's 10 o'clock and I'm like, oh, yay, time for bed in my pajamas, love my mattress, put my pillow, get my pillow right. But we are like, so sometimes I deal with the physicalness and if I can slow my breathing down, I'm, I totally know that that will change something and that something might release me, but Most all that makes it sound like it, it works like a charm every time. And it doesn't, I mean, when something, 60%. Yeah. yeah. Maybe even less. I mean, yeah. I'm saying like 30, like yeah. I can be riveted with worry. I can be mm. flooded especially at the, in, in the night. I mean, when I wake up, I, I can get, I can get there much faster, but oh, in the yeah. night when Edward's like oh. snoring next to me, oh. some of it like spills over to him. You know, I'm kind of like, what you, you, you are not carrying this at How all. How dare like, you? Look at you over there drooling. That 3am thought. Like, I'm worried too. I'm like, you are. I know. Oh my gosh. It, you're married to a, um, he's a positive outlook type. 
and yes. dating a positive outlook type. And I generally like it. And sometimes I hate it. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I'm like, are for, though. that's right. You when he like, will whatever. be like the rarest moment where he's like, I am so mad. I'm like, tell me more. Yeah. Come on. Like, mad I'm mad. Like, can we curse about it? Like, <laughs> like I, let's go. Like, let's get into it. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, there's just something about being people showing the bottom half of the glass. It goes back yeah. to our earlier conversation. It's just an yeah. invitation to like connection for me. Right. Cause you're not alone. Like either you're yeah. alone or you're not. And if I'm yeah. worried and he's not worried, then I'm alone and he's alone. And being alone is worse than being together. Yeah. You're That's right. That's why you gotta go find a girlfriend and she'll say, Oh my God, I have the exact same thing. Totally. Just, hey, I'm not alone anymore. <laughs> my central nervous system is rubbing up against your central nervous system and we're making each other okay. feel better. <laughs> I saw you. I'm glad you talked about worry. I think that's where so many of us live. Um, I have no, this is, I have no empirical evidence to support the sentence I'm about to say at all. It's purely yeah. anecdotal and simply, I don't require that of you. thank you. It's, this is simply a, a perspective limitation, but I wonder if the women aren't uniquely afflicted with, with worry. I, I am in a community of women and I lead women. So it's just our stories, are the ones that we know. And so, but something about that worry I saw that I wrote this down. Let's see. You said one time on worry that worry is the backside of gratitude. Totally. Um, Cause you have I something just, that you want. I mean, if you're not like, you know, the whole attachment and, and, and Buddhism, which is something I think about a lot and sometimes retreat into that. And it feels really good and I can kind of release, but the fact is that I am, I am deeply attached to these people and their happiness. It matters to me above all. And if the only way not to feel that is to detach, then I'm not signing up. Which means that when I'm feeling worry, it just means like, I'm crazy about you. You're the biggest thing that ever happened to me. I, and, and this is what that feels like sometimes. I mean, you know, I talked to Michael Lewis, who is a kind of a friend. We've done a lot of projects together for Children's Hospital Oakland, and he lost his daughter the summer after her freshman year. And we talked about it on camera for PBS for Tell Me More. And he said more or less the same thing, which is every ounce of pain, every unit of pain I'm feeling is related to every unit of love I felt when she was here. Lovely kind of heartbreaking, but like really lovely. But of course, yeah, of course you just pay it all back. I mean, I, I cried so hard for so long after my dad died and it eventually became obvious to me that it was like, oh my God, you have so many units to return. I mean, I have a lifetime of units and you know, it's going to sting. Oh man. It makes me want to cry my eyes out. It's just, a, um, that's a generous way to look at loss and worry. Like, look, if we didn't care about these damn kids, well, just go. Good luck to you, ma'ams. Out you go. You know, it's true. It's, it's the degree to which probably, we love. I, I bet the data does. Show, I don't know if there is data, but I bet it would show. I'd, I'd place money on women. I think maybe, I mean, maybe like men are, are worried about providing and, and that's really where they live, which is another version of love. It's like, I got to make sure I got enough to like put people through college and pay for this house and dot, 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 be ready for emergencies. And that leaves this other piece to us. But the other thing is like, at least in my marriage, like Edward doesn't feel things nearly at the depth that I feel them for better or worse. You know, I, I, I've cried, I don't know, 4,000 times in the last 23 years that we've been married and he's cried once. So, you know, like this is a really big difference in terms of being able to access like the full right. body of your emotions. You're right. I think I pick, I think I pick what we have. I think I choose it. If I had the choice, totally. Don't you? I, and all, I, I suffering it's all, worth the, it's all. worth the tears for me. Totally. That, 
that access and that honesty to me, it's honest when I, if I cry, that is true. I am telling you something true. Like I, it's going to come right out of my eyes and it's, uh, it's, I'm not tamping it down. And I think I choose that. I, I would actually, you know, you have girls, of course, and I've got three sons too. And I wish that I wish that a little bit more for my boys than they have permission, I think mm-hmm. to access. Yeah. It's a very narrow set of options for boys. It is even today. Like we know better. We have more resources. We've got the tools and still these boys are like playing with the GI Joe. I mean, there it's, it's, we're still there. um, Yeah. And and their adult options are like, I mean, the ways to be a great American man is like be a power broker, be an athlete. It's macho. Yeah. It's not, Mm -hmm. It's not like hold your best friends in your arms. Like think about the the whole, I mean, think about the difference over the lifetime of how many people you and I have touched, physically touched, how much affection, physical affection we've experienced versus our oh, guys. I mean, it's, 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 it's got to be a multiple of like a hundred. For sure. And we know, I mean, but I mean, we know that that's a calming thing. We know that that is to the benefit of our nervous system. That's right. So yeah, no, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, that 20 second hug is real. That is a um, central nervous system, like reset button. So yeah, I'm always telling my kids that. And, you know, I'm trying to like pull them to me and then they're arching backward like a cat. And I'm like, you need this. It's good for your central nervous system. You need me. Yeah. (laughs) It's horrible. I wish you would stop um, yeah, reading your like mental health books. I'm like, okay. Well, we're so dangerous for... because we're in conversation yeah. with all these people. So we're like learning right. all these little things. And oh, then we bring sure. them to dinner where we're like, you know what, Georgia, three seconds of eye <laughs> contact will drop, you know, so and so, so much milliliters oh, of oxytocin, which is a natural opioid. And <laughs> like, oh my God, if you don't stop doing this stupid That's right. podcast, That's right. I'm never That's coming right. home again. For real. We know just enough to be obnoxious. Um, I want to go to that. I want to talk about that for a second, because when I think about uh, my general sense of wellness and how I access that, like when in periods of feeling sturdy and competent and kind of whole more or less, you know, I uplink it to what are some of the factors And for me, I can always find a through line of being in a season of quality relationships where all of us, like we are each able to hear and be heard. That thing of just like bearing witness to someone's story or their moment or their pain or their joy, whatever. But like this sense of you see me, and you hear me and and it's reciprocal because that's important too. There's a real value in, in being that person and being across the table from somebody else. But I want to talk to you. And there's real self-esteem you. in that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I would say that like my self-esteem is rooted in how I have been told I have served the people yes. that I care about. That's right. That's right. It's not actually beneficial to be in a one-sided relationship where you only have a good friend and they're a good friend to you or they're a good listener that runs out of steam. Um, and I think you probably deep in your heart, you think I'm kind of a jerk. I'm kind yeah. of a taker. I'm not a yeah. giver. Or, that's you know, right. And that's a terrible thing to know about yourself. Is that like you, 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 anything yeah. unearned, I think that's like right. turns sour in your yeah. heart reciprocity is powerful for both folks, but uh, I want to, I'd like to just hear you talk for a minute about you. You're so good at this. I mean, you have a, a a book and a show called tell me more. I mean, this is one of your really special gifts in the world. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the show and being a good, what it has meant to you to be such a good listener, such a curious um, question asker and interviewer, um, because you have this knack for getting people to sit across from you and tell you really important things, really precious things like tender 
tender, not all just the, the, the highlight reel The it's, you do, you have this way. I just, what have you learned? What, what have you experienced? What is that environment like for you? Um, cause you've sat, so sat across from a lot of powerful like thing, people. Yeah. One, one thing is, um, setting the right time frame. So our show on PBS is 26 minutes long. That's what we have to hand in. Cause they have all the station identification messages and they have a little news hole and that, that, that. So, so I want to talk to them for like an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm in a bet that what makes the cut is often in the last 15 minutes. So I think like to map everything I've learned on the set of tell me more to normal interactions, time is an issue. Like if you're rushing, like it's not going to happen. And that's when we're our jerkiest, I think. And it's so dangerous because someone might tell you something like right there. I mean, people, all parents know that your kid's not going to talk to you all day long. And then at 1045, when you like, can't even keep your eyes open, they're going to start spilling it. Like you got to sit up, you got to flip the light on, like, that's it. That's your, that's your moment. And so time is a thing, which, which maybe the only other note there is that if you know, you don't have the time, like try to make sure you signal that before they start telling you something important so that they don't ever have that terrible sense that like, God, as soon as I started saying, like, I'm a little worried about my marriage, they were like, I am so sorry, but I have to go. You know, like, that's like the most awful thing because it might affect how that person talks to the next person, not even just you. Like, and that would be terrible. If somebody packed it up because they got discouraged by your reaction, that would be the last thing anybody would want to do. The other thing is that, um, I mean, I have, I have seen this go down so many times now that my faith is utter. If I ask, tell me more, what else go on? There's always a thing behind the thing behind the thing. And it's like, I mean, it's at least three deep. If I say, if I say, tell me more then I still got two more. I still got to say what else and go on. But it could be, I mean, certain people, it could be like seven deep. And that's just not how people typically talk. They, they typically, you say something and then they just, like, I think the most common thing that happens, and I don't think it's ill, in, it's Ill intent, but is they say, oh, I know, you know what happened to me? Like I had something just like that. And it's so sweet because they're trying to relate and they're trying to show, normalize what's going on. And then that can be really helpful, but you're probably wrong. That's the thing. So you tell me your thing in like five sentences and then I relate to it right away without saying, tell me more, what else go on? I probably don't have your thing right yet. So when I'm relating to it, you're internally, you're kind of like rolling your eyes. Like that's not really what I meant. That's not really the problem here. Like you're saying, I know I almost went broke too. And you're like, that's not really what's on my mind. It's not that I'm afraid of, for my financial situation. It's that I've been betrayed. Or it's that I was stupid. I didn't track it. And now I'm and now I'm full of self-loathing about that. But you have to say, you have to give them way more time, way more shots at the, way more at bats to get to the thing that's in the middle of it. So that if you do have a way to relate, then it would be genuinely comforting because it would be a genuine match for the thing that's at the heart of their problem. And I notice it with. <laughs> this is terrible, but hopefully Edward will never listen to this. But I notice it sometimes with Edward and the girls where they'll, they'll tell him a story. He'll leap in with something too quickly. And I can almost feel them rolling their eyes like, Hey, whatever. Okay. And then they just tolerate it. And then they're like, okay, thanks. And then it'll be like, do you feel better? And they're like, yeah. And then they go up in their room and text their friend. And they're like, my dad has no idea what I'm talking about. And, but, but the horrible thing is that it's this crazy ego boost to think, well, I really helped her. She came to me with her little thing and I just instantly told her, all you need to do is, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it didn't help me at all. I've been so In fact, like that. you shut me down. You, you, yeah. you buried. You, you cut it off. Yeah. I was having dinner just last night with Remy, my youngest. 
just the two of us, which is sometimes kind of hard to come by. And we had a thing between us. And I gave a, I cut it off. I cut off the conversation. I gave an apology, but I would call it half-assed at best, at best. And so, but then I felt like, well, I've done it. I said, I was sorry. Like the book said, when you're wrong, say you're sorry to your children. I check, um, moved on. Let's talk about what we're going to order. And about three or four minutes later, this is last night, we're sitting there at the table in the little restaurant right on Main Street. And she's like, I wonder if we can go back to that conversation because it still feels like a burden. And I was like, like, who gave you this language (laughs) to be so precise? It felt like a burden because I cut it short and it wasn't, I didn't let it go. I did not let it go to the depths in which she needed it to. I knew it too. I knew it. I'm like, I'd like this to be over. The like the near enemy idea, which is Mm -hmm. like, you're so, it, it looks almost like a great connection it's so close because they say something, then you say something. And if they don't do you the honor of saying, no, that's not right. But that's hard. I I think like, I think that's really hard for a kid to say is like, that's not quite right. So both my kids have done therapy at one time or another. And before they went in, I was like, so, you know, this is a tricky situation because you're a kid and they're an adult and it's junk in, junk out. So if you're not, if if they're not giving it back to you in a way that's like, yes, that is what I'm talking about. It's totally on you to be like, that's not quite what I was trying to say. Like, it's a very active game you're playing. It's not relaxing. It's not like you're going in there and you just say it and then they just start saying some stuff. It's like, you have to work so hard. It's a very intellectual challenge to express yourself specifically enough for their advice or guidance or further questioning to be actually relevant to your actual problem. Like a lot of it hinges on the patient. Right. Um, and that's the good news. I mean, that's why people say that therapy is so tiring. That's right. I've, I can't count how many times I'd finished a session and took a nap. Yeah. Just the mining of the diamond yeah. out of the, it, it, it. It's labor. It's labor. I was chatting with my book clubbers just the other day in one of our Zoom book talks about the fact that we've been reading together, you guys, for more than four years. It's crazy. We have read tons of incredible, impactful, thought-provoking, fun books during that time in the Jen Hatmaker Book Club. And this upcoming season is going to be amazing too. I actually can't wait to get into the lineup of books we have planned. And if you weren't reading with us, let's fix that. When you're a book club member, not only do you get a book box delivered to your doorstep every month with the book, of course, and a special gift and love notes for me. It's so fun. But we also have live chats on Zoom in our private group. Plus, it's really the best corner of the internet over there. I mean, like, sure, we talk about books every month, of course, but also about life. People are making lifelong friends there and finding connection with others right in their towns, getting together with their local chapters. It's amazing. When you're in book club, you also, you guys get a whole bunch of digital resources like discussion guides and custom content and music playlists from our authors, which are our favorite. So just head over to jenhatmakerbookclub.com to sign up, start reading with us and making book friends. So you guys, we want you in. It's jenhatmakerbookclub.com. The good news about being a good listener, providing a place for someone else's story to land is it does get easier. It does get better with practice. When you make a practice of tell me more at least three times, maybe seven, when you make a practice of genuinely getting to the heart of the thing and then responding in a way that that person feels entirely understood, that gets easier. And also that deepens that trust, that connective tissue is just stronger. And so the next time I find they're a little bit more likely to get there a little quicker. Right. Um, And the other thing is that it's self-reinforcing. So it's mm. so rewarding to reach that place where you're like, wow, they found the center of their problem and I helped them find it. 
that you don't even, I mean, a lot of times you don't even need to say anything past that. Like once they find it, they're like, you know what really hurts? I remember when Georgia was young, there's something happened and I was saying, you know, tell me more, what else go on? And, it, and what it was specifically was that she had like tried a joke in this social group the day before and, and nobody really laughed. And then the next day, the, the very popular girl who has a very high social standing in our town because she's part of this family that has high social standing did the same thing. And everybody just went bananas. Like it was the funniest thing they ever saw. And I, I was like, that is such a specific and relatable moment, but it was like five pages in, you know, you had to like keep asking, but the reward of having seen her get there and like put her finger on something that specific was so strong in me that it motivated me to keep saying, tell me more what else go on. Because the satisfaction on my side, seeing her get there was so high totally. that it's like self-reinforcing. Oh, I love that. Which also goes back to time. That goes back to your initial like structure around this type of connection, which is generally it's not quick. I had a really, really good friend we're, we're 15 years in the back and she came over two days ago and we sat on my porch for two hours as a catch up. You know, the porch you've been on it. And we were, I mean, the, the whole point is come over, let's sit with a glass of wine and let's go, let's go where we go deep with each other. So it was, uh, we even, I even had muscle memory for it. And with her, we're at the one and a half hour mark. When I finally said, I'm going to tell you something. I have not told a single other human person an hour and a half of me being involved. I was in, I was in on the game. I'm like, here we are. Let's do it. What's going on in our real lives? An hour and a half. So you are right that for virtually every person, even no matter how well we think we know them. Yes. Oh, of keep course. going. Keep even your it. partners. I mean, that that's like a real sort of intellectually humble place to try to live in more, which is like, I don't know you that well. Like Edward's father said double bypass surgery. And it was like, how do you feel? And then it's like, what else? Are you going to go? What does it feel like? Talk to him. Like, and the, and he doesn't know. So he's like discovering it as he's talking it out. And it's, it would have been so easy for me to think, I can tell you exactly how Edward feels. You know, I've been with him every day for 23 years. Like I know the dad, I know the situation, I know the dynamics. This is how he feels. And that's such a mistake because it, we're hopefully like changing and growing all the time. So I don't know version, the version of Edward that is today. <coughs> <coughs> you know, like he's a little different this year than last year, today than yesterday. And to honor that by asking questions is cool and good for the marriage. That's a great point. Um, two very last questions. Cause then off you go, you, you've got leather pants to put back on. I do. Mm -hmm. You right. have, you have mm -hmm. a New York fancy life to live today. I do. Jen. Um, you do. Yeah. You're when black from head to toe, that's the uniform of the city. You've Guess what? gotten I'm the be memo. In my dad's old pajamas by 5. PM tonight. Yeah. But yes, that's for one minute, I'm going to go out there. That's right. I do love that about you, by the way. <laughs> oh, so the first question is this, just going back one notch, what's the most like, I don't know if this is even a fair question, but interesting or like fascinating conversation you've had on the show, like, or even unexpected that you thought it was going to zig one way and it zagged another, or somebody just dropped it right into your brain. And you're like, well, good grief. I did not see that coming. Or that was just I don't know. Um, you know, we both are in the lucky and weird position of talking to fascinating people all the time for our jobs. Um, and so, yeah, yes. But sometimes people can really take us by surprise. So I, I did an interview with David Byrne. I was a person who loved the talking heads, still do. Couldn't believe I got it. Couldn't wait to do it. Went on bike riding with him in New York City, which is the way he gets around with his little bike that says D period burn on it with his phone number and his address on the rim of the bicycle. I was like, huh, you're really unaware of, of how famous you really are. But anyway, 
like to a point of neurodiversity, he is um, a little different than your average bear. And that difference makes him utterly accessible. Like he's not self-conscious. He's not that guarded. And so we had this moment early, but he's also been interviewed 10,000 times and that's always dangerous because people are going to just hit play on their greatest hits, as you said earlier. And I caught him off guard early on and he like turned to me and looked at me in this way. And you can totally see it in the edit where he was like, Oh, like, kind of like, this is gonna be, this is gonna be fun. And he had said that when he was young, I said, you know, he got kicked out of the choir at like 12 or something. And he, you know, he's not a classical singer. You could imagine that he wouldn't like work in that way. He's such an, uh, an individual that maybe a choir where you're supposed to blend is not the perfect platform for his talent. And I said, you got kicked out of the choir. Were you devastated? Like, did you think, wait a minute, like, I'm, I want to be a musician. And he's like, I didn't want to be a musician. And I said, what did you want to be? And he said, I wanted to be a mailman. And I said, why did you want to be a mailman, David Byrne? And he's like, because you have benefits for life. And I was like, so you're a 12 year old who's thinking about the need for benefits for life. And he's like, well, also you just get to be alone all day and you get to ride around in the truck. And I, and then I said, and you get to wear that uniform. And that's what caught him off guard. Like, he's like, yeah, you're right. Like I, I would like that. Cause I'm a guy who is, has this aesthetic vibe that wants to use all the tricks to my advantage. I want to use outfits. I want to use language. I want to use sound. I want to use lighting to make my points. And he just got such a kick out of me saying, don't forget that uniform. <laughs> I'm so tickled. So that was a blast. Oh gosh. How lucky. How and then there was a delay before we went. Uh, so we finished mm -hmm. the seated portion and then we were about to get on these bikes and they were going to put a rickshaw in front of us so that they could be filming us in the back. And it took a really long time. So I had 45 minutes totally alone with David Byrne in a loft in New York City. And I had just seen American Utopia, which is this phenomenal Broadway show that he put on that you can watch on HBO. And it's phenomenal. And I mean, I had deep questions that would not have been appropriate for PBS because it was too much like um, like a master's in literature seminar. Like I was like, let me ask you something about the bare feet. You know, like, did that mean, or he probably loved that conversation. Oh my God. I was, yeah. I was in heaven. Yeah. Oh gosh. And that was all like away from the cameras. You just got to stick totally. that in your hip pocket. I was That's like, just one more thing. <laughs> he said he wanted to film it. Like, did you tell him you need 17 cameras? Did he know that? You know, like, it's just it's amazing. It's you're deep cutting, that. like you're in the deep cuts. Uh, that probably just phenomenal. delighted him to feel that yeah. known by yeah. you, that you weren't just phoning in an interview. Totally. Um, and you want yeah. that to be known. Like yeah. that, that's an urgent sense I have is that it like, is. I am not a hack. I have been living with you for two or three weeks. I've read the book. I've listened to 14 interviews with you. I watched everything that's available on you. Like I am ready. And that's this feeling I have at the top of every interview of like, how can I ask a question in the first like three minutes that indicates to you, I can do. Deep I know down. you. Yeah, I know you. I like who you are. I want. I want other people to know that. It's so good. Okay, that's it. That's the last last question. Here we go. You always have to answer this because remember, you're a five Peter, the yeah, first and you. only. You first hold the singular title. Peter. I'll send you, you something. Thank yeah. you. I'll come up with something. It won't be as cute as that sweater, <laughs> but I'll come up with something. Um. So anyway, you've answered this a bunch. And it can always just be whatever it is today. So what's saving your life right now? Not drinking alcohol. Tell me more. <laughs> I wanted to sleep. I'm yeah. very sensitive to alcohol more so than ever in my life. Like I could, I could easily get slapped with a headache after one drink that would last me 24 hours, 36 hours. Um, so the, the cost benefit just couldn't, I couldn't get it in balance anymore even with just one drink. So it's like, I, I don't know. I like, I stopped metabolizing it or like I'm allergic to it all of a sudden, or it's like poison to me now. So anyway, I said, forget it. I give up. And man, I just sleep. I wake up every day, like ready to climb a mountain. Like it is remarkable for me, the impact of that. 
but again, I was super sensitive to it. Like Edward, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't bother him at all. And he doesn't stop him from anything. But for me, it is completely like lifting a lead blanket off myself. Good for you. When, when did that start? A couple of months ago. Yeah. Yeah. So look out like that- the next time you see me, I'm going to be like twice the energy. <laughs> And it's not going to protect me from um, aging poorly. Like, I feel like it's just yeah. got to be, yeah. it's got to help my me stay sharper. The, the, the upside is almost complete. It's almost a full yes. upside. Yes. Um, yes. So, totally. it, especially at our really age too. I'm like, it's, it's just me and Edward and he wants to have a drink. And I'm like, oh. you know, like I don't care. It doesn't bother me if you want to have one. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he cares that much, but you know, like that's like a nice fun thing for a couple mm. of years. Well, it's just in the social fabric of our interactions, you totally. know, as in every, in a, in a thousand different contexts. Yeah. Every um, billboard is like two sexy people having a brown drink over a large ice cube. That's what it is. And, and you're in the city where people get together for drinks. That's, oh my God. That's what people do. Holy smokes. Yeah. It's just one whole big city that drinks. So, um, that's good. Good. I'm glad you feel good. You look good and good for you for just saying, I can't, I can no longer find an upside here. Yeah. Let's just try it. It's too dangerous for me. The headache thing just makes it so off limits. Oh, it's off limits. That's great. Now you can Uh, love you more things. I love you too. And I'm so happy to see you and um, thank you for coming back on and for talking course, about honest things five with me. Peter sweatshirt. I'm a Jen at five Peter. Yeah. Yeah. You okay. just get excited. Okay. I have your address. Yeah. And so, um, I'm going to noodle. I would that. like it hand delivered too. <laughs> oh, like well, I actually like that. At my door. Yeah. I actually like that. I, we, I think I'm going to have a trip up there in December. So let me I know you can't that. resist. I know the pull for you is so great. Can't resist. It's strong. It's a real strong pull. Okay. Love you, sis. Bye. Well, there is a reason that she is the best. And that's why I just love every minute that I ever get to spend with Kelly Corgan. I always walk away thinking something new or pondering something in a fresh way, or I don't know. I just love her to pieces. And I'm so happy to have brought her back to the show for our first ever five, Pete. Um, Thank you guys for being here. Listen, if you haven't already subscribed to the show, go do it, man. Like wherever you listen to your podcast, it'll probably take you 12 seconds to subscribe. And that way you'll never miss an episode. We'll just show up handy dandy. Week after week, uh, we sure love making this show for you. It is definitely a labor across many, 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 many people. And it is a joy to bring it to you week in and week out. More to come as we start wrapping up 2023. We have some amazing episodes to finish out the year, and I don't want you to miss any of them. All right, you guys, see you next week.